Ephesians chapter 3. I'm going to start our expository study here today. Ephesians chapter 3, 21 verses in this chapter. And uh, definitely some interesting things in here. This is where I talked about in two weeks ago there that uh, the hyper-dispensationalists will get some of their teachings from Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to see about that. Um, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. For this calls I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. So wait a second. The prisoner of Jesus Christ? Uh, no, no, Paul. <laughs> You're confused. You see, it was the Romans that Paul was the prisoner of. No, it was Jesus Christ. So what are you talking about? Turn to John chapter 19. Very important concept that you need to get a hold of here. John chapter 19, verse 10 and 11. It says here, Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. So in other words, Pilate had no power except what God had given him. You can read about that in Romans chapter 13. We're not going to go there for sake of time, but Romans chapter 13 talks about the, the powers that be or, are ordained of God. So Paul very wisely said, it's not the Romans that put me here in prison. You know who it is? My Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's a difficult attitude to manifest. <laughs> you know, uh, how would I feel if I went to prison? Would I look at the thing and say, well, I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ? Or would I say I'm a prisoner of this rotten, stinking, disgusting, New World Order Catholic system? You know? I mean, I'm not preaching to you as a perfect man here, you know, as I say oftentimes, you know, a lot of people, you know, think I'm whatever, you know, it's just like, I struggle with some of that stuff. I don't want to go to jail for preaching the gospel. I don't want to be persecuted and tortured and things like that for Christ. That stuff's scary. I read stories about that. That's scary stuff. It's very scary stuff, you know, but you know, if it ever happens to any of us, to you out there, you need to think of it and say the Lord allowed this to happen for a reason. Paul accepted the fact that he was in prison for a reason. He was witnessing the people in there. Very interesting. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. We'll read that verse. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 2. If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word. Okay, as I said a few weeks ago there about the thing of dispensation, what does dispensation mean? It basically means God giving you something. He's dispensing something to you. Now see, a lot of the hyper-dispensationalists, they say that we are currently in the dispensation of the grace of God. They use that as a title. But see, there's a problem with that. Because God has always dispensed grace in every dispensation. Every single time period that's out there that's go the whole way back through the Bible, there's always been a measure of grace. You say, yes, Brian, but the grace today is better than any other time in history. Well, I know that. I'm aware of that. You know, God is more grace for us today than He did at any other time, outside of maybe the Garden of Eden or something, you know, around there. But God has extreme grace for us right now, and He, you know, dispenses us, or dispenses that to us, excuse me. But the fact of the matter is, you can't make that a title for this current dispensation because, you know, it just doesn't work that way. You know, there, there are people that are going to have grace in the time of Jacob's trouble. God has certain grace for people then, you know. I don't think it's going to just be like, you know, those that aren't part of the 144,000 that are sealed, the, you know, the time of Jacob's trouble saints, that God's just going to be like just pouring out wrath and fury and just like, I don't even care. I think that there's even going to be a measure of grace there. The Bible does talk in Matthew chapter 24 about those days are going to be shortened for the elect's sake. You know, now you could make that the 144,000, whatever. But the point is, God is going to have some measure of grace at any time period, at any dispensation. So, what this is talking about here, I believe, 
is Paul is saying this grace that God had, you know, by grace are you saved, you know, Ephesians chapter 2, we read about last week, that grace, God dispensed it to Paul so that Paul could take it and give it to us. You know, as I said in another study, you know, it'd be kind of like somebody, a bunch of people, 200 people coming here and saying, hey, I need something to read. Well, God gave me these books and I can dispense these books to the people. Okay? That's what's going on there. Verse 3 through 7. Let's read this. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. It says here, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Now, let me ask you a question there. Were the early Christians in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, were they preaching to the Gentiles? You say they preached to everybody. No, they didn't. They preached to the Jews. And there were signs and wonders that were given to confirm the word to the Jewish people. You see, you study the book of Acts, they're starting out going to the synagogue. They're keeping the feast days. They're going to the Jews. You say, well, then Paul was the very first one who went to the Gentiles. No, Peter actually did. Peter went to the Gentiles. But it was just kind of a quick thing or whatever there. And, and what was it, Cornelius' house, I think, that he went to, you know, and God shows Peter that he's cleansed these unclean animals, so to speak. And he says, what I have cleansed, that call not thou common. So what's happening is the book of Acts is a transition book. And, and I'm going to tell you about hyperdispensationalism in, in a minute here, the problem that comes in there. But in the book of Acts, you have the gospel being taken first to the nation of Israel, and after they reject it as a people, as a nation, there's still thousands of them that are getting saved. Individual salvation, yes, but nationally they still reject Jesus as their Messiah. Even after he came up from the dead, even after there were 500 eyewitnesses to it, you know, all these people seeing Jesus, they see him going up to heaven and all this other stuff. Incredible. They're seeing signs and wonders, people being healed, people speaking in the tongues that they were born with. You know, the, the languages there, Acts chapter 2. They see all these things, all these signs, and they still say, I don't believe in Jesus Christ. And at that point in time, the gospel starts to come to the Gentile people. See, Acts is a transitional book. And that's why it's very dangerous to go to the early part of the book of Acts when they're in that transition time and start to say, well, they're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and so that's the gospel for today. And not, you know, faith and, and whatever else. That's uh, dangerous, see? Now, where hyper-dispensationalists come in, they come in and they say, see, the gospel was not revealed until Paul, so all the people before Paul, they were not in Christ. Only from Paul till the rapture, they're the ones in Christ. The others were not in Christ. That's a heresy. That doesn't work. You say, how do we know that that doesn't work? Well, keep your hand there in Ephesians chapter 3. I'll show you a very simple verse that you can use to debunk the whole hyper-dispensational thing. Go to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 7. Paul writing here, by the way, it says, Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. So there were people in Christ before Paul showed up. So you can't say the hyper-dispensational thing that... People that are in Christ are from Paul to the rapture, and before that they weren't really in Christ. That doesn't work by that verse right there in Romans chapter 16. There were people in Christ before Paul showed up. Okay, And, you know, hyper-dispensationalism is like a lot of these other heresies. You read the Bible, you'll never come up with this stuff. Where you start having the people come in and start to get you confused on this is when, you know, they've, they've studied other books and other movements and things like that. Just reading the Bible, you're not even going to find this stuff. You have to tweak it and twist it and change this meaning and change that. But you can read the book of Acts and you can see, hey, things are changing as time goes by here. 
You know, they're speaking to the Jews. They're going to the synagogue. They're speaking in tongues. They're healing. They're doing all this other stuff. And by the time you get to the end of the book of Acts, you know, over and over again, Paul's saying, I'm going to the Gentiles. I'm going to the Gentiles. You know, you have the council there in Jerusalem where they come up and they're Paul and Barnabas and they come in and they're like, you know, are we supposed to just preach salvation to the Gentile people? Or are they supposed to be circumcised and keep the commandments and all this other stuff? And what are we supposed to do? They're discussing it. There's a transition that's happening there. Okay? And that gospel that we preach today was fully committed to Paul, fully dispensed to Paul. But the other disciples and apostles, it's not like they're saying, wait, Paul's a heretic. He's preaching another gospel. No. They're saying, you know, uh, let me let me find the verse here really quickly. Um, with Peter, because that's the big contention, you know, that Peter had one church and Paul had the other church. Uh, not even sure where this one is at. I don't have this in my notes. It just kind of popped into my mind here. But, you know... The Bible talks about, you know, who also our beloved brother Paul hath showed us, you know, I should have written that one down, or as also our beloved brother Paul has showed us, pretty sure that that's 1st or 2nd Peter somewhere, well, somebody put it down in the comments, I, I'm not going to take the time to go through it right now or to try to find that verse, I cannot think of it, it's one I don't have memorized, but, um, Yeah, I'm not sure where it's at. I'd have to look it up. And like I said, it's not really part of my notes, so let me continue on. But the point is, there was a transition in the book of Acts. There is a transition period there. That doesn't mean that there are two bodies of Christ. Like the hyper-dispensationalists try to teach by perverting Ephesians chapter 3, there are verses 1 down through 8. Okay, it doesn't prove that. All right, there's only one body of Christ. Okay, there was a transition in the book of Acts, but... Those people that were saved early on, they're saved, and they were saved the way God told them to be saved in the early part of the book of Acts. And they didn't have to get re-saved when the gospel is fully revealed to Paul or anything like that. No. It's just that when that transition happened, now the guys that were saved early in the book of Acts are preaching the same way that Paul's preaching because it's fully been revealed. Why was it not fully revealed right away? Well, very simple. Because the gospel was presented, Jesus Christ was still presented as the king to the Jewish people, to the nation of Israel. And see, they had a free will to accept or reject him as their Messiah. They rejected, so now the gospel went to the Gentile people. That's what's going on there. And again, you know, you'll have people, they'll say about Ruckman, he teaches different, you know, plans of salvation in the book of Acts. No, Ruckman teaches the transition happened there. People lie about Dr. Ruckman all the time. That's why I get irritated about it, you know, and it's just like, you know, I found out all this information on this website that hates Dr. Ruckman. You know, why don't you study the guy and, and actually look into what he's saying and actually read and listen to the sermons that he's actually preaching and see the context of why he's saying certain things? Of course, a lot of people don't want to do that. It takes too much work. But uh, let's continue here. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 8, it says here, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's very interesting. You know, less than the least of all saints. Paul would say that? All these mighty works done by the Apostle Paul, and he says, I'm less than the least of all saints. I'm lower than anybody. You say, why would he do a thing like that? Well, let's go to Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, verse 24 through 26. It says here, And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth 
serve. Was Paul a servant? Yeah, he was. Paul was a servant. That's why he humbled himself. Now let me ask you a question. Where do you consider yourself to be on the, uh, in the realm of the body of Christ? Are you humble? I hope so. Certainly hope so. But uh, let's continue here. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. The Bible does say that God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Again, you want God's grace. So we all need to humble ourselves before the Lord. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. You say, well, Jesus was a created being. Then how could he create all things by Jesus Christ? That doesn't make any sense. How could God create all things by Jesus Christ? Because Jesus Christ is God. Yeah. It's not that Jesus Christ was created and then he created all things because then all things couldn't be created by Jesus Christ. <laughs> See? You know, people don't seem to understand the plain teaching of Scripture there that Jesus Christ is God. Verse 10 and 11. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's another verse, you know, these two verses are also very interesting there. You know, might be made or might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus. There it is again, in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, we should understand things that they're the uh, principalities and powers in heavenly places have figured out. You know, that they can see Jesus Christ is God. Now, think about that. Um, do you have a connection there? A relationship to the Lord? Well, I'm a, a child of, of God. That's there. But I'm also a member of His body. You say, well, then you are God? No. You're a little God? No. <laughs> um, a demigod? No. <laughs> no. Not by a long shot. I'm just related to him. That's all. And so anybody that wants to try and hurt me, you're going to have to go and get permission from God to be able to do that. And the principalities and powers, you know, the Bible talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. We're going to be getting there a couple weeks from now. The Bible talks about we wrestle not against flesh and blood and lists a bunch of things. One of them is principalities and powers in heavenly places. We wrestle against them. You're struggling with these spiritual wickedness in high places all the time. We're struggling with that. But the fact of the matter is they know who we're part of. They understand it. And as a member of the church of Jesus Christ, you should understand it too. Understand your relationship. And that's a good thing because you say, wow, you know, I'm really part of a, a powerful family here. I'm power, part of the family of God. I'm, I'm part of his body, actually. That's a good thing. But it's also a convicting thing because you're supposed to act like a saint. Got to keep that in mind. You're supposed to act holy, in other words. Now let's look at uh, verse 12 and 13. It says here, In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that's very important. You know, our boldness should remove our fear of the world. And Paul's going, I've been through prison. I've been through all these other things. He talks to the Corinthians about that a lot. And he's like, I've been through all this stuff. And whatever, I'm just going to keep fighting. You know, hey, the things I've been through, okay, it's not going to stop me, you know, from continuing in the ministry, you know. I mean, there are times I get weary. There are times I get kind of down and I'm just like, oh, I just wish I could walk away from this whole thing. <laughs> it's just, it's a huge responsibility being in ministry. It's a giant responsibility. People think it's just an easy thing to sit down and write a sermon every week or whatever. I got news for you. 
uh, it's very difficult sometimes. I mean, there's no time off, you know, from work. I mean, you get attacked, spiritual attacks are incredible sometimes, and I don't mean that in a good way, you know. And, and what is it? Well, if I was just like, a, you know, doing this to make a living and whatever else, and there was really no spiritual fruit coming from it or whatever, well, how would that really prove anything, you know? Uh, no, the fact of the matter is that what happens to me, what happens through this ministry, a lot of it's because you, you out there, you're my watchers, my, my viewers, you know, you've written things to me and sent me links, and a lot of the sermons are coming from you out there, and the Lord gives me the scriptures to put behind it and everything else. We're working together with this thing, you know, and it's for your glory. You know, a lot of you have, have probably been like, you know, I wonder when he's going to get around to that sermon request, and you see, hey, here it is. I know a lot of you have written to me personally and said, hey, thank you for getting around to that question that I had. Well, you're very welcome, but, you know, thank you for giving me, you know, the idea. And the Lord, you know, worked through you to work through me to give the answer out there. It's a great thing. And we can have boldness knowing that we have that confidence that we are saved and part of the body of Christ. It's pretty neat. Let's continue here. Verse 14. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, you have a lot of these new versions. They'll take out Lord Jesus Christ and just you bow your knees to the Father. Very interesting there. But another little conviction here. Or convicting question, excuse me. little convicting question. Who do you bow your knees to? Do you bow your knees to just a buddy? No. Do you know who you bow to? A king? Do you treat the Lord like he's your king? The Lord kind of put me that, he put that thing on me as I was doing this study, and it's just like, do you really treat me like a king? <laughs> you know, <laughs> there are times the Lord tells me to do some things that I'm a little bit slower doing them than it would be if I was actually being ordered by a real physical king to do something. You know, just kind of convicting. You know, uh, the old uh, thing I've said in this different studies, I heard this years ago, and it's always stuck with me, always been a conviction, and that is that, you know, they say in the military there's only three answers that you're supposed to give a superior officer, and that is, yes, sir, no, sir, no excuse, sir. You're taught to take orders. How much more so taking orders from a king. So, well, God's long-suffering. He's patient. He's this, he's that. Yeah, I know the scriptures. I know where they're at. I know the verses, you know, that talk about him being patient with us. I understand that. But uh, if you really want rewards when you get to heaven, you better start thinking of, him, thinking of him as a king and bowing your knees before him. Let's go on to verse 15 and 16 says here, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. There you see the thing again. There are Christians that are in heaven right now. Their soul and their spirit's up there. Their body's on the earth. Right now our body and soul's down here, but our spirit's in heaven. So we're all part of the same family. But we're up there. Verse 16, that he would grant, un grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Okay? Again, another very interesting thing there. Because you're strengthened there with might by his spirit in the outward man. Right? So you get bigger and bigger and more and more muscular as time goes by and you're walking along and you got big muscles and all this. No. No. You're strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. You have an inner strength that comes through years and years and years of going through hard times and... and whatever else, and coming out of it, being victorious because the Lord's working through you, okay? Working all things together for good. That's very important to remember. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Keep your hand there and go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 5 and 6. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verses 5 and 6 says, For when we were come into Macedonia, 
Our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Okay? You say, wait a second. I thought you were supposed to be strengthened in the inner man. But they were saying within were fears. Yeah, you see, because it's your thoughts and your spirit and everything else fighting against the Holy Spirit sometimes. You see, when you have fear within your body, with, when you have that fear within you, it's because you don't fear God. You say, is it possible to live a fearless life as far as fearing man? Absolutely. Absolutely possible to live a fearless life. How many of us do? Not very many. We start getting fear of man coming in. And without our fightings, you know, a lot of times we're fighting and things like that, but within our fears. You start to do the old what if game. You know, what if this would happen? What if they would say that? And what if this? What if, what if, what if, what if? You start to worry. You start to think about stuff like that. Again, I do it. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm not trying to justify it or say, oh, you know, it's wonderful, whatever. There are many times I fear man when I shouldn't. Excuse me. You know? It's really convicting. Something to keep in mind. Now we're going to go to Philippians 4.13. If you know your Bible, you know what this one says. Philippians 4.13. One to keep in mind here. It says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Strengthen in the inner man over here in Ephesians chapter 3. Over here it says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Are you in Christ? Is Christ living in your heart? Then you can do anything. Anything that God has for you. Okay, okay, you know, let me clarify that. Keep that in mind. Again, like I said, very, very convicting. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 through 18. Okay, it says here that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Okay, um, now this is very interesting, and maybe I should do a study on this, a separate study. I can't get into a whole lot of it right now. But the fact of the matter is, this is talking about, you know, um, her, her really good message on this by Dr. Peter Ruckman the one time about, you know, the universe. What is the universe? Very interesting study. And this verse right here, verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, people say, of the love of Christ. But that's not what it says. Notice there's a semicolon and it says, and, and to know the love of Christ. So what is going on up there in verse 18? Go up to verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Okay? And you say, well, see, there's the love again. But no, it's not what it's talking about in this context here. Christ dwelling in your heart. Okay? And verse 16 being, you know, the strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. And, you know, Verse 15, of, whole, of whom the whole family in, earth, or in heaven and earth is named. So the point is, you are part of Christ in that relationship there. You need to comprehend sometimes what, how big God is there. You know, and I realize His love is great and everything else, but it's not talking about, I mean, how are you going to measure the uh, breadth, length, depth, height of love? Love is kind of an intangible object. It's not something that you can measure it and stuff like this. What could you measure? Or at least have kind of a comprehension of how big it really is. You aren't going to measure it exactly, but a comprehension of how big it is. The universe. Very interesting here. And like I said, there's a, there's a lot of scriptures that you can get into. The Bible talks about that, you know, the heavens are like a vesture, a raiment, you know, that, that God is one day going to remove that vesture. You say, what are you talking about? Turn to Romans chapter 10, verse, or excuse me, not Romans, Revelation chapter 10. I think that this is one of the most significant verses of Scripture 
Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. This is the atheist death verse, because <laughs> there will be no more atheists after this. Revelation chapter 10, verse 7 says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Okay? Now, right now, there is a veil that is upon the world. You look up there and you see the heavens. And you say, I wonder where God's at in all that. What if God is right behind it? You say, huh? What? What? What are you talking about, Brian? I mean, the heavens are, they're eternal. They go that way and they go that way and there's no, you know, whatever. I don't think that. What if the universe, there's a breadth there and a length and a depth and a height, you know, however you want to make that. What if the universe is just contained and you say, well, uh, that doesn't make any sense though because we can't see the end of it. Did you ever take two mirrors and put them together like that and you look in there and you can't see the end of it? It just goes and goes and goes and goes and goes. What if the heavens up there are, you know, actually just a distance? And of course, we can't measure the distance. It would still be too huge for us to measure in our little finite minds. But what if that whole thing, the heavens there, are like mirrors and God's right on the outside of it looking through? It's kind of like a two-way mirror, you know? I remember I was at this one place and this mirror looked kind of like a little bit you know, dimmer than, than uh, most I'd seen, and I just kind of, whatever. And here I found out that it was actually a two-way mirror. You know, kind of an interesting thing. You know, and the police will have these uh, interrogation things, you know, where they have the mirror, and they can stand in behind the mirror, and the people can't see them through the mirror. You know, what if the Lord's like that? What if the Lord's looking down through the universe, and He can look, and He can see everything, and He's just on the other side of the heavens there? You look up at the stars at night, you see that starry sky. Right on the other side of that's the Lord looking down. And guess what's going to happen? The Bible talks about that He's going to fold up those heavens someday, like a vesture. He's going to fold them up. Wouldn't that be something if during the time of Jacob's trouble, the Lord just goes, pulls that veil off? Not going to do it right now, but it'd be like if I had a blanket over top of the camera, you can hear my voice. You can sense my presence, but all of a sudden, that veil pulls off. When you see me and you see everything else that's going on there, God's going to do that one day. And guess what? There won't be any more atheists, like I said. There will be no more mystery of God. People are no longer going to say, oh, I don't believe that God exists. And you know the funny part about it is? You read back in the book of Revelation there, chapter 10 on back through, the people still rebel against God. They blaspheme the, the God in heaven. The mystery of God is finished. They can see God. They know that God exists, and yet they still hate Him. You see, it's that same way with a lot of the people out there that call themselves atheists. They've seen enough evidence. They've seen enough proof that there is a God, that this world was created, this universe is created, and yet they don't want to believe in God. They'll rebel against God no matter how much proof you show them. That's why you don't want to waste too much time on some of those people. Very interesting. But let's continue here. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19 through 21. And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to, ex to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You say, well, what's the point of all this? Well, you got to understand how powerful our God is. And he is only able to do great things through you when you believe his word and when you trust him. You see, faith, you know, the acronym faith there, you can make it into an acronym and it's, Forsaking all, I trust Him. That's what faith is. Do you trust God? Do you trust His Word? 
You know, when the enemies of the Bible start to come down on the Bible and start to say there are contradictions and this doesn't line up with that, and actually we found this historical document and it says this, it says that, do you retain your faith in the Word of God? Or does it kind of start to falter a little bit? When the atheist professors come out and they say, we've disproved God, there is no God. We've That's just religion. <laughs> the opiate of the masses. <laughs> do you retain your faith? Or do you start to kind of doubt? God's not very stylish anymore, you know, so do you, do you stay with God? Or you start to say, well, you know, the friends that I hang out with, the people I hang out with, uh, they don't believe in God. No. I, I can't really say for sure that God exists. You might want to rethink that. You see, this little universe that we are living in right now, I believe it's just a box. And God is on the outside of that curtain. And He's looking through there. That mirror that makes it look like space goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on in all directions. And in reality, it's just a curtain there. I'll grant you it's a big one. <laughs> it's a very big one. But at some point in time in the future, God's going to say, whoop, and He's going to pull that thing away. And all the world's going to look and there's going to be God. You say, explain the mechanics of that to me. I can't. I can't understand how everybody on the planet's going to be able to look and see God. You know, look up there in the sky, and there He is. But it's going to happen that way. And it's, it's rather interesting, too, that the Antichrist is going to try to do that same kind of technology. You know, there's been talk of that, you know, Project Blue Beam and some of this other stuff, you know, where they're going to have projecting things onto the sky and all that, and they say, you know, the... Uh, I mean, you get into some of that conspiracy stuff. I don't know how much of that, how far do you take it. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, I know Satan tries to imitate everything that the Lord does. I do know that. I can prove that from Scripture. Definitely. You know. So, just an interesting thing. But I just want you to keep in mind, brethren, that uh, our God is greater than all the people, all the wickedness, and everything else in this world, our God is greater than Satan. Satan is a defeated foe. I mean, his his he will be a defeated foe. Right now, he's still doing, you know, making a lot of trouble. But uh, the Bible prophesies his doom. And you know, I had this guy the one time. Uh, I think it was one of the Tolkien. My video is attacking Tolkien, and I, you know, he was like, you know, saying he's a Satanist, and we're going to be putting curses on you and stuff. And I said. Why are you worshiping a loser? The Bible prophesies your God's destruction, Satan. And your God has to answer to mine. Why on earth would you waste time wait, you know, worshiping a loser? You know. Something to think about if you're a Satanist. You know. So that's going to be it for Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, let's close here with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do pray that uh, you'd help all of us to keep in mind, to comprehend how big you are and how as big as this universe appears to be, Lord, that, that you're even bigger than that yet, that you are above it, and that uh, you encircle it, Lord, and, and uh, that one day all these wicked people that, that laugh at you and mock you, they're not going to laugh anymore, Lord. They're, they're still going to blaspheme you. They're still going to hate you, but they will see you one day, and that mystery of God is going to be finished. And Lord, I do pray that that time would come soon. And I pray if there's anyone out there listening to this, Lord, that they would take the opportunity to take some time to watch the salvation message at our channel, to make sure that they are saved, to go through the scriptures, Lord, to put their faith in what your word says and not in what a man says. I just pray, Lord, for that. And uh, I pray that you'd help all of us to just stay faithful to your word and stay true to our beliefs and our convictions and not let anybody talk us out of them. And I just uh, pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. That's going to be it for this week. Next week we're going to be talking about Ephesians chapter 4. It might be. I'm not sure. Like I said, I might um, actually put in another study just to kind of break this up a bit. I'm not sure yet what I'm going to do. Um, you know, there's a lot of video projects that I have going and everything else too. So definitely going to be trying hard to get a lot of videos out. Um, 
please keep the sermon suggestions coming. We do appreciate that. So, I guess that's going to be it. But uh, just, you know, the, the one thing I got from when I started to study the book of Ephesians, and as you study this thing along with me and, and we're studying it together, the one thing that you can really come away with is just this feeling of all and just bring, being in the presence of the God of the universe and our relationship to Him, that we are in Christ Jesus. We are born into His family. We are, you know, God the Father watches over us, and He, you know, has sealed us with His Holy Spirit of promise. It's an amazing, amazing promise, amazing book, the book of Ephesians, uh, just to keep us in mind of our relationship to the Lord and the fact how great He is, how powerful He is, and that we need to comprehend how big He is. I mean, walk out at night and just look up at the sky and just think, if God's right on the other side of that, up there, and it's so far away I can't even come close to touching where He would be. He's on the other side of that. You look way over that way, and you look way over that way. The Bible says that He measures the span of the universe with His hand from there to there. You know, I remember back in high school, the big thing would be, you know, the, the guys, they'd try to, try to grip a basketball with the palm of your hand. That was like the big thing. If you could do that, you were a real man, you know. You could hold on to a basketball like this, hold it up by gripping it with your hand. Most guys couldn't do it because your hands aren't big enough for that, you know. It just, you don't, can't get grip enough. And I remember I had this one friend in high school, and he was really huge. He was like six foot six or something like that, and, and, uh, right around 300 pounds, he was, he was big, and he could do it. He could hold the basketball with his hand. His hands were huge, and he could hold it. Well, it's kind of like that's what the Lord is doing with the universe. It just goes like that. That's about that big. What's it going to look like when he pulls that cover away and the mystery of God is finished? Ooh, <laughs> that's a thought. Don't fear man. Fear God. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay? Keep that in mind as you go through life this week. And uh, all of us have those times when we fail the Lord, but brethren, you can go right back to serving the Lord again. Uh, if you fail, you know, and, and you don't put a tract out when He tells you to, or you don't witness when He gives you that opportunity, don't beat yourself up about it for a long time. Just say, okay, I failed. I, I messed up. Lord, sorry for that failure. And get right back into it. Try harder the next day. So just keep those things in mind, and we will see you next week. Thank you for watching.